welcome. Uh, indeed, my name is Bogdan Shmilovic. I work at the Center for Urban History, and this is my pleasure uh, to announce today's lecture. But before we proceed, I'll just say a few words about uh, uh, the event in general. So this is the set of online series of the Center for Urban History, which are done in cooperation with the University of St. Gallen in Switzerland. And uh, the set of these lectures we call the Mount to Mountains from a City, Imagining Carpathians in Arts and Culture. And in the role of these uh, 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 the series of lectures, we will have four uh, uh, or rather even five lectures, but that's, that's not uh, clear yet. But what we have already the plan for four lectures. The previous lecture was, uh, uh, it, uh, presented to us by Dr. Patrice Dombrowski uh, from the United States. And the next lecture uh, will be by uh, Dr. Ksenia Kebuzinski from the University of Toronto. But today's lecture is uh, made by the Ukrainian scholar. Therefore, we, uh, we decided that it would be good to have at least one of the series of these lectures in Ukrainian language. So it will be done uh, in Ukrainian. And uh, it is my pleasure to introduce you, uh, Dr. Vladislava Moskalet. Vladislava uh, studied uh, at the Ukrainian Catholic University. Uh, she graduated uh, with, uh, uh, with a very good diploma, and then she was admitted to the joint uh, PhD project at the Jagiellonian University in Krakow, uh, and she ended up with a beautiful project uh, titled Jewish Industrial Elites in Drohobych and Boreslav in 19th century. So um, her uh, research project was mainly uh, dedicated to uh, developing uh, economical development of Carpathians and also the relations between Jews and local uh, elites around Carpathians. Uh, so uh, Vladislava Moskalet will uh, discuss these issues in her today's lecture, which is uh, titled Barons and Peasants, an apparent Jews in the mental and physical spaces of the Carpathian. And uh, again, uh, we switch to Ukrainian language. Uh, those of you who don't understand Ukrainian, please press the interpretation button in the lower side of your uh, Zoom. Uh, uh, and uh, after the lecture, we will have uh, co commentators as already, as Mariana said, Martin Rode and Dr. Bogdan Techolos will, uh, will discuss with us uh, uh, specific matters. So uh, please, Vladislava, the floor is yours and uh, we are happy to have this lecture today. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good evening to everyone. Uh, English speaking, as I guess, but I'm sorry. Today I will speak. Uh, I will speak Ukrainian, and you will hear mainly uh, my interpreter. Uh, I'm very happy to welcome you, and I'm really happy to see so much interest for this topic which is very close to me. And I find a lot of interest in this topic myself as a researcher, but I only started and I still need to take a deeper look. Tonight, we are going to talk about different Jews and how the Carpathians have been changing them. The Carpathians as the point of transition where Jews are being transformed and have changed. And I'm going to explain more about this in the coming 40 minutes. I decided to start this presentation with the excerpt from the novel, The Slave, by the Nobel Prize winner, Isaac Bashavis Zinger, who wrote in Yiddish. And he wrote this text in the 1960s. This is a story about a man, a Jewish man, and uh, he lost all of his family due to the Khmelnytschina events and he had to flee. So he escaped to the Carpathians. There he became a slave. 
he was enslaved by the Christian family in the Carpathians. They were farmers, the peasants, and they were exploiting him, his labor. He lives with them and he lives this life that is absolutely alien to him. Before that, he lived in a town, he was in commerce, he was reading books. But when he got in the Carpathians, he found himself in a totally different world where he had to do much of physical labor. And he is uh, detaching from his community. His name is Yankel. He starts to herd the sheep, spending his summers uh, in the mountain valleys. He forgets uh, the important Jewish holidays. He doesn't have the calendar, so he carves the important dates on a piece of wood. He forgot the prayers, the words, and he also fell in love with a Christian woman, so he got detached from his native community. But he also gets more sensitive to the nature. He gets to notice the nature around him. It's not that the nature is stealing him from the Jewish uh, roots, but he gets to rethink and reconsider them. I'm trying to retell this um, story for you if you haven't read it but at some point he gets to meet uh, some jewish people from the neighboring town and they basically buy him out and they bring yankel back to his uh, family not the family because the family perished but to his community so he came back to his shtetl and they um, revived uh, very fast but he realized that he was not able to live there any longer that his life uh, now should be different uh, and uh, a certain respect Respect, uh, this uh, beloved uh, Ukrainian uh, Christian lady was to blame for that. And of course, mountains played a role. Later, he realized that he would not be able to adjust uh, to this uh, shtetl like life that he had had before. So he returned to the mountains. And I decided to use the quotation here. It describes this uh, time when he passes this threshold uh, between the civilization and the mountains. So we don't quite understand from this story where exactly the location is, but he is traveling from Krakow to this Polish side and he settled down there. So he stopped uh, and turned around. And then this is the quote. He stopped and looked around. He was lonely, the same as Adam. There was no one around, no traces of people or their work. The birds got silent, and the silence was only challenged by uh, the sound of the stream. And uh, he remembered uh, of this uh, stagnant air in Yusef of the town where he used to live before, how he spent days uh, with the books, uh, and he realized that he couldn't tolerate this life any longer. So he decided to get back. Uh, we can see the story describing a slightly different period from what I'm going to discuss tonight. Uh, but uh, this is a good illustration uh, for this uh, opposition of the world of civilization and the world of nature, which was odd and painful for the Jews because their entire life was about studying the books, uh, the texts. Uh, it was not the life in the nature. And next, I'm going to talk uh, about what it meant to be Jewish for the people who stayed in the mountains. So I would like to talk about the text, about the uh, reports, the stories, and they are authored by the journalist from Warsaw. His name was Joel Masboim. He was a rather popular author at that time. He, he would write uh, the coverage, travel reports from various places. He used to travel a lot and in 
at one point uh, he went to the trip uh, to write uh, the report the travel report from one of the Holocena uh, towns uh, at that moment it was the Warsaw based newspaper and uh, they uh, covered uh, the places like Skola, Kuta, Kosev and other villages around this area one of the ideas of Mazdboim who was uh, affiliated with the socialist ideas was to show the diversity that was uh, typical for Halicina. In 1929, it was the time when it was no longer Halicina, it was the uh, so called Polish area, and this name Halicina was not the official name, but uh, it was part of the Second Polish Republic, and in their perception, it was Halicina, and it also covered the Carpathians. Joel Bastboim went to Drohobic and Boroslav to see the Jewish workers. He went to little towns near Lviv, where he found the Frankists. Also, he got interested about the Jews uh, who converted into Christianity, also the Jews who were uh, very rich, uh, also the intelligentsia, also the marginal uh, people, also the uh, Jewish people who would be close to the rabbi in Chortkov, uh, Chortkiv and Bells. So he is trying to show the entire diversity of the Jewish world. One of the visits uh, was to learn more about the farmers, uh, the Jews who were the farmers, and he describes it in the following way. He uh, is telling the story how he was traveling from Kolomea to Snyaten. These are two towns in Halicina, and he had a stop uh, in um, a village in Shtetl, and he went to the market, and he saw the Gutzels and also the Jews among them, who were doing the same things as the others, the local uh, residents. They were selling the poultry, uh, selling the crops, but they were still speaking Yiddish and also Ukrainian. So they are mixing these words up uh, and he could hear these two languages and he got interested who they were and he went to, to talk to this Jewish man who looked like Gutzel and he actually shared his story. He came from the village and he said uh, there were other Jews around and there was this Jew, his name was Pesach Baba and he invited this journalist to visit their place. The journalist went to this uh, village on uh, Friday and he described that uh, point and this quote actually describes uh, his uh, experience on friday the card brought us to a small village generally there are 20 families living there 17 gutzel families and three jewish families these three jewish families could also be seen as uh, gutzel families because they are very similar to the others they have these helmets uh, the swords from the old austrian times and the portraits of the emperor on the walls the jew i visited was called pesach bab this is how they call him uh, they he has uh, five uh, women, uh, five daughters. One is taller, the other is more beautiful, the other is merrier, etc. All of these ladies are already engaged, but their fiancé are not there. They went either to the army or to some markets. And uh, he is singing the Ukrainian, they are singing Ukrainian songs uh, and they are longing for their by friends. This journalist was really thrilled about what he saw, this mix of cultures. He said that the Jews uh, uh, were isolated there. This was something uncommon uh, there. They are a minority in this village and he was trying to get this man interested with the jewish matters for example he started the conversation about the palestine about the wars uh, 
but he failed to, to um, inspire any interest. Uh, he would other, either talk about his days uh, as a young man in the Austrian army, or he would talk about his uh, daily routines. For example, he would tell the journalist about um, the crops, uh, about the yields, uh, etc., about his farm. At that point, uh, the Jews who were doing the crop farming, uh, it was a rather widespread phenomenon in the region. Here you can see the map of Halachana. And if you take a look on the th third uh, bottom uh, field, you can see this place. Not far from Stanislaviv, you can see a couple of villages, Nadvirna, Manjava, we can see Bohorochane, Delaten. Around this place, around this area, which is the Subcarpathian area, there are villages where Jews were living and they were engaged in crop farming. Why would it be interesting to pay attention to them? What is interesting about them? Because when we talk about the Jews, this uh, a farming or peasant life is not typical, is not something that we would find as the closest association. And the idea to resettle the Jews to the land was part of the uh, productivization uh, enlightenment ideas. It means that there was the idea about productive and non-productive work. When there is productive work, then you produce something and especially with your hands, you grow things, you create something. Non-productive work, this is what Jews usually do. This is commerce, this is uh, uh, about money exchange. Yeah, this is something which uh, is not comprehensible for the journalist, for this person. That is why when we talk about the beginning of the 19th century and also about the enlightenment in Europe, and uh, especially when we talk about the Moskins, the Jewish enlightenment, uh, there was this idea to resettle the Jews to the land. And whenever they start uh, engaging in the productive work, they will become the same as everyone else. We can see the first records from the beginning of the 19th century from these villages. Also, there was this foundation of Baron Hirsch who was building the schools for Jewish children. And he was, uh, um, there was a scholar, Moris Triblander, who was traveling around and he found these villages around Stanislaviv. He described that there were people who were living the poor peasant life, the Jews, and they were eating the grits and the milk. For him, it was the argument to say that if the Jews were living the uh, poor Jewish life, this uh, means that they would not try to make use or benefit from the Christians. It was a very good and a valid anti-Semitic argument to confirm and provide evidence that they could live the same as others, they could be poor the same as uh, the Christians around, etc. When we call, uh, talk about the Masboim and his observations of this time, he described his meeting also to show that uh, how this uh, culture was developing in the isolation. This is the culture that was detached from the context from the rest of the world or the rest of the Jewish world. And he wanted to show their physical capacity and force. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, many photographs from this region. But we can take some records from Transcarpathia. This is the region behind the Carpathian mountain ridge. And Jews uh, settled down in this area quite late, in the beginning of the 19th century. Usually they were resettling from Halachana. There we can see from this uh, 
a table from this uh, statistics that uh, over 60 years the number of Jews has grown a uh, twofold which is the first uh, uh, growth of the population mostly due to migration so they lived in these uh, provinces of Ungberg and Marmarasch and their situation is unique we have this book about Transcarpathia uh, by uh, Jelinek and in his book he says that Jews in Transcarpathia were in a unique situation because there were no differences in the social activities as uh, you can find in Halachina. In Transcarpathia Jews were engaged in various activities very often it was the timber cutting as you can see in this photo they are engaged in wood felling and uh, they sell the berries the nuts uh, uh, they uh, fish and they herd the sheep uh, they work on the land uh, and they could make wine or grow the fruit gardens uh, or the vegetable orchards and the transcarpathia or as, as it is called in um, Jewish newspapers and the Carpathian uh, Ruthenian land uh, actually is the place where Jews lived quite in quite a poor life this crop farming was the something that was seen as the method to help the Jews uh, make their living the interest to this region is also encouraged by the Jews who were engaged in the physical labor. These photos were made by a well-known photographer, Roman Vishniak. You, you probably know this name. Uh, the Joint Foundation procured him and commissioned him to travel around different regions in Poland, but also in Transcarpathia, where he was taking pictures of the local Jews, poor Jews, especially those who were doing the, the farming. And it was in 1938. In this photo, you can see a man, a Jewish farmer, Simke Michlowicz, from the Vishniaps village in Marmarosh region, which is the southern part of Transcarpathia. When we take a closer look at this photo, and Roman Vishniak was taking pictures of these regions, but there are also some videos, and they are showing how these people work. We can see some differences in how the people from the cities are depicted in his photos and how he depicted the people from the villages. Basically, it can be explained by the objectives and assignments uh, that he was given by the Joint Foundation. He wa they wanted to show the bright uh, scenes uh, uh, to produce a good impression. Uh, to fundraise, maybe to engage more funding. And we can see how he focused in his pictures to the physical labor um, when he took these pictures in Transcarpathia. Take a look at this photo of a farmer. He also was taking some mm, footage, uh, the video, how this uh, Jewish farmer was plowing his field. Uh, also, he was taking picture of the Jews still wearing their high hats uh, and they were engaged in physical labor. This is the illustration of something that uh, uh, basically express there's hope of the Jews for the future uh, based and uh, relying on this physical work uh, examples uh, because they could be sustainable they could be providing for themselves uh, another group uh, I would like to talk about I mean the group of Jews and they are related to the Carpathians uh, uh, in uh, different places in the Carpathians. This is a slightly different group. And these are the wealthy Jewish families, the so-called Jewish barons. 
This is the area of Skole, which is the subcarpathian area, and uh, the so-called uh, uh, Skole uh, Beskida place and also Marmarosh area. They get to be a popular place to build uh, the so-called summer cottages, summer houses or manors for the wealthy Jewish families. One of the best known a family was the Cram Baron family and uh, they uh, managed to get this status without uh, converting into Christianity because they largely contributed to the economic life of this area. In particular, they were engaged in the wood processing and um, timber industry. We can see their palace in this picture. This is one of the landmarks of the Skola town. We can see this barren in the center. Um, during the First World War, the army entered the place, this palace, and it's quite ruined. Before that and after that, the palace was a center, a financial and cultural center, because why would call it uh, was so much at, uh, attractive for the barons? Because there were many woods around and they owned these areas and they uh, really promoted the hunting, hunting activities. It was a very popular uh, activity to spend time. And the people who owned these lands were very rich. Uh, and this baron was in the top 10 uh, of the wealthy people or uh, landowners in Poland. So Jol Mastboy, uh, the one who I started talking about, also went to Skole in 1929 because it was an interesting place, an attractive place, and he went there for the sake of the Gradle Barons, and he walked around the place and saw there are very few things Jewish. However, he could not see any Jewish initiatives or cultural organization, but he was actually interested in that, and uh, he saw that they were lacking there. But despite the fact that the Austro-Hungarian Hungarian Empire um, was left in the past, um, basically the barons uh, owed it to their wealth uh, to this empire, but they remained. And uh, this is what he says about them. The exhausted Austrian crown was left in the past. Uh, and uh, all of the possible supporters also followed the cause. But uh, the children uh, stayed uh, and the children actually got uh, attached to this barren status. But they were more closer to the Jewish life. Some of them were also supporting the well-known parties and also contributing financially. It was not understandable for Mastboim because he was born in the Polish kingdom, but when he came to Holichina, he discovered the entire uh, motive uh, of longing for Austria, longing for the emperor, Franz Joseph. And uh, he could feel this uh, when talking to the Jewish uh, peasants or Jewish barons or Lviv citizens, and he found it hard to understand and he realized that their life was quite good they were doing quite well but uh, he when he met Baron van Hammer in the scholar town who lost all of his property during the war because of the Russian army and he was still experiencing this war trauma and this baron was walking along the street with his wife, uh, uh, was quite sad with his cane. And the only thing they still had were the memories of this Austro-Hungarian times. But there were also people who managed to keep their property and wealth in the interwar period. These were the families of the oil uh, tycoons around Drohobych. This was the topic of my 
uh, PhD thesis. So they uh, lived uh, in around Skole. And we have the photos of this time and how the house looked like. Unfortunately, it didn't uh, come down to these days. And uh, you could see these photos. These are the postcards. It was the local landmark and the local people were proud of it. We can see the car near the house. On the left, uh, we can see what they were doing for leisure. It was hunting. This was the lifestyle of these uh, rich uh, bourgeois uh, people. And it became more important than the other typical activities, intellectual activities or other that would uh, seem more appropriate to the classic Jewish elites. Uh, so these people, this family owned this manor until the Second World War, until the Holocaust. And the family is still uh, living and they still have the memories of Skola and this lifestyle that they've had. And now I would like to talk about another motive, also focusing on Carpathians as a place that could host the Jews and where the Jews could become different. This is the legend about Baal Shem Tov. He was the founder of the Hasidism mystic movement. The point of it is that, uh, that they had different uh, spiritual practices and they wanted to comprehend the mystic contact with God. One of the legends about the Baal Shem Tov that was described in the book that came out in the beginning of the 19th century and it tells the story that his rebirth started uh, uh, from the seven year period of isolation in the mountains and he had various mystical revelations there he met some criminals uh, and they never uh, could be found again after contacting him. And there are um, some places related to Baal Shem Tov, and there was this ethnographic study by uh, the researcher Hayes uh, near the place Yaseni Verkhny, and it's located close to Kosovo and Kut. These are the towns that uh, are mentioned in the well-known song about the Baal Shem Tov, where he was walking around, washing his face, whatever uh, is described there. A researcher has collected the materials uh, from the Christians who lived in this village, also from the Jews from the surrounding towns, and these legends include the stories about how Baal Shem Tov uh, blessed that place of Varkhni Yasani so the Jews could do well there. And uh, the Christians also show the place where Baal Shem Tov was washing himself, where he was praying and uh, reading his books. Uh, it was the cave. Uh, but it was felt at that time when he saw it. Also, they tell him that there is this transition place, transition bridge in the Carpathians that leads you to the uh, mysterious secret place uh, in the Palestine where the uh, wise men used to live at that time. There was the center of Kabbalah and Baal Shem Tov was using this uh, uh, gate this transition to travel to that place and consult with the wise men. Nobody was able to show this road to the researcher, but they told many stories about how other Jews were taking this road, uh, or maybe they took the cow and uh, placed a note, a message into the ear, and then when the cow came back, that cow brought the message with the answer in the ear. 
so this is also the symbol of the animal traveling around the two and in between the two worlds as it is as the popular image in the jewish folklore and it's also very popular because of this uh, story by ishmael yosef uh, agnon that you probably know as well also in 1933 uh, we uh, have uh, an interesting uh, period to discuss. We realize that in this time, the Carpathian Mountains become the pilgrimage uh, uh, place. We can learn more from the article that was published uh, in 1933 in the Lviv Huila newspaper by Leon Weinstock. He described his trip uh, that he made with the uh, rabbi to Kosiv and another place of Brown. There was this famous Polish uh, author, Stanislav Nimczyk, and also he promoted Hutsul plays Hutsul Szczyna in his texts. Weinstock described that in his opinion, the mountains, the Carpathians were key for the change that uh, happened and to Baal Shabtov. And uh, basically, the system of views of the master basically reflects uh, the mountains and how they could impact. When he came down uh, barefoot uh, to the valleys, uh, when he stayed and preached about his uh, uh, wisdom in Tlusta and Majibosh, he was uh, himself. Uh, and uh, he emanated uh, this uh, um, bright uh, and uh, unmarred uh, breath of the mountain space. So basically, these places turn into the pilgrimage uh, destinations, uh, and they really find it important to focus on nature. In Hasidism, for uh, pilgrims, it is more typical to uh, go and visit the uh, matzava of the rabbi, uh, rabbi or the grave of the rabbi. Here, it would be enough to go to see the river or maybe the mountain. And the nature is seen as sacred uh, place here. This is how the experience of Leon Weinstock is described. From this Hutzul simple life, from the sadness uh, and deep thought uh, that is inspired by the uh, forests and the mountains, uh, from this powerful stream of the rivers, uh, you could have the opinion of Baal Shem about the simplicity and joy of life. Uh, and uh, Masboim, who also went to that place and realized the cult of uh, Baal Shem, he went to the place which is called Kota, and it was well known, like Koasiv, like Jabia, all of these places, uh, uh, they are related to the Bashd legend. Masboim was rather disillusioned. Uh, to see Kuti in 1928 uh, is uh, a non-famous place for uh, Hasidic people. But he met and came across some German-speaking people, and he described them as the Austrian-looking uh, people. And this Austrian flair of Halachina and the German language uh, uh, speech uh, that uh, refers him to Hasidism as well. Uh, also, in order to understand the spirit of Hasidism, Weinstock went to the nature and he came across a work, uh, he came across a, a person who came, uh, took him to the a mountain ridge and it took nine kilometers and on the way they could hear the sound of the mountain streams as a symphony with the sounds of, of harps and other music instruments and this place is called Kamen 
and he said, I couldn't believe that I finally am at the place where Baal Shem could stay. This is where he was saying his pra prayers and seeing his revelations. And here he also met a Christian, a German, who also wrote the work by, uh, by Baal Shem and he changed his life and he got to support uh, Hasidism. And practically all authors writing about this story, about this plot, uh, they mentioned that. First of all, they mentioned this legend of Baal Shem and also about this uh, a villain. Um, they claim it could be uh, Alexa Dovbush uh, and uh, also about this story when they talk together and then this villain promises he would never sin again, etc. The Christians uh, this way also support this Baal Shem um, legend. This place uh, is taken by people, especially by Weinstock, as a place of Hutzel people where everyone lives by side by side. Uh, also, we can see this in the text of other authors of this motive of the neighborhood, that different nations live side by side as neighbors and they interact without any conflicts. And the last but not least, uh, to describe uh, uh, about Carpathians, uh, as the place that is changing the Jews that is considered to be the place that would change people. These are the places, the Carpathians, that is used by the Jewish youth movement. Specifically, we can find references uh, about that uh, with the researchers researching the interwar young uh, movements, youth movements and young people. And uh, these young people were usually recruited by different organizations, uh, like the C1 organizations, uh, and they were arranging the colonies for young people in the Carpathians uh, and uh, around Skola and other places. The goal of uh, these uh, people uh, who enrolled uh, into these uh, movements usually these were poor boys and girls and the participation in this movement was the opportunity to forget about the mundane everyday life and they could not afford to go on vacation to the carpathians so these young people are taking to these camps uh, and uh, they organize the courses, uh, the entertainment for them. And these people describe this experience as the life-changing experience. This is the first time they faced the nature and uh, they discovered it anew. And this isolation that they find in the mountains uh, that are detached uh, and far away from the urban life uh, as something which is important uh, and changes their lives. And uh, obviously they can contrast these places of civilization. When they go to these remote locations uh, in the nature, they realize this is something that can help make new people of them. So many courses that uh, were based on the Sionism ideas they prepared these young people for the prospect of resettlement to the Palestine and they prepared them for the prospect of physical labor. This is something that we can see in the uh, uh, quotations that I provided in the beginning about this uh, novel, The Slave, when they talked about these ideas of the physical labor, when the Jews shall not only use their, their soul, but also their body to do the physical work. It is also typical that this motive of Carpathians is also popular in the literature. It becomes popular already after the Holocaust. I can quote two authors, and they were partially Romanian language speaking, Hazar Stasha, who wrote these songs about the Carpathians, and the Vizhnitsa native, Burg, and they were writing novels about Carpathians. They were 
uh, writing stories, poems about the Carpathian Mountains, and they uh, rediscovered this uh, these mountains uh, for themselves. So basically, uh, this is the end of my story. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you for attention, and I am ready for questions. So I'm going to invite uh, our first disputant uh, from Germany and uh, let me say a few words about our colleague. Uh, Martin Rode uh, studied history, Slavic philology and Eastern European history in Salzburg in, and Göttingen. And then he followed his uh, doctoral degree at the University of Innsbruck and he made a dissertation uh, entitled National Science Between Two Empires, the Shevchenko Society of Sciences in 1992, 1918. So uh, Martin Rode made his uh, major research work on Naukove Tovaristvo imeni Shevchenko, and he uh, speaks perfectly Ukrainian and some other Slavic languages. And currently uh, Martin Rode uh, has uh, a postdoctoral position at the Institute for Geschichte at the Martin Luther University in Halle Wittenberg. And I am happy to invite Martin uh, to uh, discuss a uh, lecture of uh, Vladislav Maskelec. After Martin, we will switch to Bogdan Tichulos. Well, then I haven't hear I don't hear you anymore, and I haven't heard the the end of my introduction. Do you hear me at all at the moment, or is my uh, Wi-Fi problematic? No, no, we hear you. So, Martin, you can, you can. We can hear you. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Um, I'm very sorry if you don't hear me at any moment. Please try to give me a sign or write me something in the chat. My Wi-Fi is a bit problematic, right? Um, so, so thank you, Bohdan, for the invitation and the kind introduction, and thank you so much, Lada, for this uh, rich and stimulating, and also rare approach to the Eastern Carpathian region as a Jewish space or as a uh, rather Jewish spaces in the Eastern Carpathians. Uh, you started your uh, talk by explaining briefly how the Carpathians were constructed in a Jewish literary perspective. And I think this is um, an intriguing attempt to contextualize a problem at hand. Not uh, only were Jews imagined as a predominantly urban group in Galicia, like you put it, but also the Eastern Carpathians were imagined as an ethnographic territory predominantly inhabited by Hutsuls, Lemkos, and Boykos, and not all these other multicultural societies of which you've shown us some important parts. The construction of ethnographic and national uh, territories, and you already heard that is my focus, so excuse me if I'm going into a little bit of um, broader details here, is a big theme in histories of scholarship, literature, um, national movement and regional history also. Such politicized and often national lands, national or nationalized landscapes envisioned as ethnographically homogenous spaces were produced and these processes are worth deconstructing. Um, just to give you one example, Mikhail Rahomanov, who discovered the Ukrainian regions or uh, then uh, Russian regions in the Habsburg Empire for the national Ukrainian national movement refer to them as Galician, Bukovinian, and Hungarian Rus, or Halitska, Bukovinska, Uhorska Rus. And these regional terms signified Це означає, що це також позначає регіони Карпат, які були привласнені такими національними і етнографічними означеннями. Ну, для Східних Карпат це також і проблема, тому що їх часто сприймають і на початку ХХ століття, зокрема, а також у часи незалежної України, як українські Карпати, а не Східні Карпати, в принципі, чи якісь, які приналежні до певної етнічності. Оцей термін «українські Карпати», він був запроваджений Степаном Рудницьким. 
racist narratives envisioned the Eastern Carpathians as such a homogenous Ukrainian national landscape. In Chagradil, uh, to define his idea of Ukrainian national territory as a whole. And well, this is just a very rough and selective uh, sketch of uh, Ukrainian approaches uh, to the transnational discourse on the region. We could add from Russophile, Czech, Polish, Slovak, uh, Romanian, Austrian, Hungarian viewpoints. To, um, I hope it helps to show a bit of a link between Patrice's lecture in March and Lada's lecture today, because there are some frequently used tools to discuss the problem at hand. And I think Lada used all of them very brilliantly. brilliantly. So first, deconstructing our national and ethnographic imaginations. Second, demonstrating the plurality of, for example, ethnographic research attempts uh, taking place like you did in the end of your talk. And uh, third, contrast those imagined territories or imagined spaces with physical place, like you call it in your title, or um, by going local to make these overlooked um, persons visible, like you did in the analysis of your coverages, for example which showed how Jews appropriated territories and thereby underlined the heterogeneity of this inherently transcultural landscape. So that brings me to a first uh, bigger question. Um, since inter-ethnic relations are such a quite problematic topic, especially in the interwar period, I would like to, to ask you to go in a bit more details and how your reporters dealt with it, probably how previous expectations um, were different when they actually visited um, the space. Um, so uh, you had so interesting examples of Jews acculturated to Hutsuls later on, or Hutsushina as something like a transnational Arcadia. Um, finally, the barons that could be described as a part of a transnational social elite with pro-Austrian nostalgia. But violent anti-Semitism was uh, rather absent from your talk. Um, did that play not ro no role at all in these reports? And were there maybe some imagined differences between Prekarpatia and uh, Zakarpatia or Malopolska and Podkarpatska Rus or whatever you want to call those two sides? Um, um, maybe I might ask you also to go a bit uh, deeper into the available sources for this kind of research. For example, can you um, contextualize those coverages uh, you presented to us with archival materials um, that is a bit related to uh, the questions I'm bringing up now, because from a perspective of history of knowledge, for example, several questions uh, may help to tackle those travels. Like, um, how did the reporters plan their travel? Did they work out like they planned it? And also what I mentioned before, how did it meet the, the reality, meet their expectations? And have they had especially local support? Intermediary figures often turn out to be crucial as they showed travelers around, guided their views, and thereby they even had agency. So the locals were not only passive subject in coverages. Um, to, add, to, to add up on that, we know from comparable research travels on Ukrainians in the Eastern Carpathians that some locals were not really thrilled to be investigated or photographed, even by Ukrainians themselves. Do the reports reflect on that? Was local collaboration or at least acceptance present in your reports? Or is the situation like completely different would be very interesting to me. Um, maybe on a side note, when you discussed the ethnographic research in the end, I wondered whether it makes sense to you to consider also Jewish museums, especially like the Jewish Museum in Lviv in uh, 1934 as some um, yeah, to, to add up on that or maybe to, to draw a larger picture on this ethnographic research because, well, as you heard, I'm very interested in that. Um, of course, I have some more points, but maybe I would cut it at this point and uh, let's uh, dive in the discussion. So thank you. It is uh, also very nice to see such a lot of familiar faces online with us today. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Uh, Dziakuję uh, Martine, thank you Martin, and uh, uh, for your very valuable comments and very interesting questions. Again, just before we proceed to Ladislava, I announced that uh, there is a space also for everybody to put questions. And uh, after official commenters, uh, please go into the lower bottom of your lower bar of your Zoom 
bar and then uh, select reactions, raise hand, and I will see those who raise hands and then you can have possibility to put the question uh, by voice or you can write in chat. Okay, Laska. Я можу починати. Okay, Martin, це буде добре, якщо я відповім. Martin, would it be fine if I answer in Ukrainian? I just don't want to switch the channels. Thank you very much for this brilliant analysis, uh, which is rich in methodological aspects. Uh, and I'm really impressed. Uh, if I'm going to continue and pursue this topic further, I will definitely consult you more specifically. I need to say, well, I, I really encourage you to write the questions because I'm on the beginning of my road and I do hope that your questions will help me understand where I should lay my focus. I might have overlooked some important aspects. As Martin aptly mentioned, my work is about the constructed image of Jews and I deliberately chose the Jewish sources. I took a look uh, at the Ukrainian narrative and the Ukrainian sources when I was uh, searching some details uh, about the people that they wrote about, but I generally wanted to understand what Carpathians were in the interwar period in the imagination of people. For me, it was very important to see that Carpathians actually finally popped up in the interwar period, and I was trying to find uh, some uh, references to the word of Carpathians in the uh, Jewish uh, media, like in Yiddish. We have the names of the local places. Also, we have coercive Kute places mentioned, but we don't uh, hear this mountains or Carpathians, the entire concept of the mountains. This is the concept that they borrow from the neighboring concepts from the Polish or Ukrainian narratives. And this is when it starts being created after the First World War. And this song that I uh, didn't copy, but I would like to include it. It's very illustrative for me. It's the song about 1914, about the First World War, and it is uh, basically reverberating with this Ukrainian song, Chorna Rilane Zorana. It's very close to the Yiddish uh, folklore, like this uh, man died and nobody cares, and this black uh, raven would uh, Eat the eyes, etc. That this is something that originates from these Carpathian uh, developments in the First World War. There was the brilliant question about the conflicts related to conflicts. Obviously, this is the peaceful reality that I described. Uh, from the point of view of these uh, storytellers, this Carpathian place is presented as a non-typical place, non-mandate place for the Jews. Uh, obviously, uh, there have been the Jews who have lived there for centuries. It was the uh, typical common place, but for the newcomers, it was an uncommon place. The place where the barons and the peasants would live side by side. Uh, and. Uh, Really few things are described about the conflicts, but uh, the author of these coverages writes about the uh, war. He was writing them 10 years after the war, and in Halachina they all have these memories about the war. He visited the uh, military memorials, uh, the mass graves, uh, and he was impressed uh, how the war uh, destroyed uh, the uh, rabbi um, uh, house uh, in Chortkiv and this place became marginalized. Also in the Carpathians, he describes this baron who lost his uh, riches in the war and became poorer. And he describes how the soldiers were burning his manor down, how they uh, really degraded them. And he was describing this this episode. Uh, so in this imagined world, the war was this uh, character of the perpetrator, of the villain. But other aspects are little described. But when I was 
Uh, I'm sorry, um, I have a problem with the sound. We have some technical issues. Can you hear me? Бо ти сама може вимкне відео, і ми ну, тоді може звук буде краще, не знаю. Can you try and maybe switch off the video? Excuse me for this technical issue. I will come back to you in a second. Technology is not a safe thing to rely on. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Now, my, I run out of internet, but I have the backup. So I was talking about the war and about the meaning of the war and significance for the war as the breakthrough point for the Carpathians. But when I was trying to find the information about Skola, Skola it was an important place in terms of um, hosting all of these wealthy uh, people but also they organized these courses there. I was trying to find more information about Scholar and I found uh, um, these references to the Jewish stores uh, in the interwar period. Today, I was talking about the untypical Jews, but there were also typical Jews there in the interwar period. Uh, if they were owners of the shops and stores, uh, they were the targets of uh, uh, attacks. Uh, also, I was trying to find the information uh, about the Carpathians and their perception in the Ukrainian text, and I saw many complaints. I cannot remember the author. It was the Ukrainian author. I will find it later. But he was saying, like, we are going to the Carpathians to find the nature, the clean nature, but unfortunately, everything is occupied by the commerce and by Jews, and there are so many of them, and they bought all of the villas there, etc. We are not able to enjoy the nature because the Jews, you know, invade it. Uh, so from these texts, uh, we can see that the relations could be rather tense. Uh, and it was true in some cases. But uh, also in the media, very often, they are trying to talk about this coexistence aspects, and especially the text by Weishten. Um He writes a lot about, uh, he has the huge preamble in his text telling about the Hutsul region, about how beautiful it is. And these are brilliant people. And it was really peculiar for these coverages, this uh, focus that they make. So they focus on the non-Jewish uh, citizens living there rather than on the Jewish citizens, even though it was the focus of their uh, report. Uh, so this is also illustrative of the Jewish interwar media newspapers. As to the Baron uh, and this ethnographic research, and it was so far the only research I managed to find, but I didn't continue it further. I could say that the museum in Lviv, the Jewish museum in Lviv, uh, uh, focused um, a lot on the material heritage and many uh, people of culture were interested to preserve this uh, interwar artifacts. Uh, Today, we were also talking about the Lusta place. Uh, this is the native place of uh, Baal Shem mother. And this is the important element of this cult of uh, Baal Shem Tov. And uh, he goes uh, to this place, uh, this reporter, and he uh, came down to the village and he can see that the cemetery was destroyed. It was 1929. We can see today the reverberations of the Holocaust and the Soviet times when they destroyed the Jewish cemeteries. But it was 1929 and this is exactly the story that he was sharing about this Jewish cemetery that was uh, destroyed. And he asked, why would you allow this cemetery to be in such a dilapidated uh, condition? And they answered, well, if you are interested, go and tend to it. From this, we can understand that this focus on the material culture in the Carpathians in that time was probably even um, smaller than today. Uh, 
But there was much focus on the folklore. And this author, the researcher Hayes, he mentions the names of people from whom he collected the information. He mentions the places where he collected these uh, folklore pieces. Uh, that's why this uh, um, research is valuable. We can trace how the legends travel around the locality. Uh, and there were different versions of the legend, you know, because according to one version, the Baal uh, came from this village of Varkniyar and or from the other place according to the other version but if we search for more materials i believe we could have a, a better look and better view of these details uh, thank you uh, i hope i answered your questions thank you to vladislava thank you to martin and now we have the second round of comments of this interesting um, presentation and Mr. Bogdan Tekhulos is going to comment. He is a Ukrainian literary scholar, a philologist, but he is well known for being the expert in Franco studies. I mean, from Ivan Franco, uh, the national poet, and also he is the director of the Lviv Literary uh, National Museum of Ivan Franco. It's not named uh, after Ivan Franco, but it's the Museum of Ivan Franco. He's also the doctor, uh, the, the doctor PhD uh, of sciences. He presented his thesis some time ago. The, he's the associate professor at the Department for Journalism at Lviv National University. We asked Bogdan to comment on this lecture in terms of uh, his uh, expertise in literature rather than uh, the Jewish history. Because Vladislava is also using the literary sources, the travelogues, uh, the memories. Uh, so please comment more from the perspective of the literature. These are the sources that have this emotional tint. We do not have uh, the separate lecture about the mountains in Franco's heritage or legacy in this series of lectures, but mountains also play a role in uh, uh, Ivan Franco's legacy, so I believe we can be looking forward to an interesting input. Thank you, Botan. I would like to commend uh, Vladislava on the brilliant presentation. The key mission is to, uh, of the moderator is to interrupt the speakers. Well, uh, my expertise on this aspect is exaggerated. So I would not exaggerate my role. And that's why I'm part of the minority who would not be boasting. Well, I was thinking about these texts that you were telling about. I haven't read them, I need to admit. And I was thinking, I wish I could read them and I really feel like reading them. So in terms of uh, uh, discovering the interest to these texts and discovering the new senses to these texts, I think the, then uh, the uh, uh, message and the main message uh, of this presentation was successful. This uh, presentation also broke the stereotypes, uh, but this is all science, this is all research. So congratulations, Vladislava, because uh, um, you managed to reach these goals. Next, I'm going to share uh, about my impressions. I will be talking about Ivan Franco because this is part and parcel of uh, my old talks, but I would like to focus on some aspects of this topic that I find most important and most interesting. They're worth elaborating. I'm going to talk about the positivist empirical uh, aspect uh, and also in terms of uh, theoretical methods to be used. I think both are important. I would think of an essay by Yuri Andruhovich, a Ukrainian author, who is really Carpathian centered, uh, even though he uh, doesn't live there, he had an essay from the collection My Last Territory, and it was entitled uh, Carpathology Cosmophilian. He says that this is like the meta science of future, Carpathology, but it failed to find all of the answers to the questions that might be interesting. So today, 
we actually were listening about the non-apparent or invisible Jews in the Carpathian space, both in the real space or in, in the imaginary space. These were basically the foundations of this cosmophilic uh, Carpathology, I think. Car Carpathians were presented as the real space, as the geographical category. Even though all of these are very relevant, these are the um, relevant uh, ideal uh, structures. This is uh, about the nebula, not the corpuscle. So when would the Carpathians start? Where do they end? Those who go to Carpathians, they know this common question. Where would Hutsul areas start from? So when you go there, when you travel there and come to that place, any place, I don't mean to, uh, to to name people, but is this the Hutsul area? No, Hutsul area is far, farther away. This is not the mountains yet. So these Carpathians are like a rather imaginary place. In fact, one of the topics I got very interested in is how can you correlate in the modeling of Carpathians as the space of the natural and civilizational space? How do you correlate these aspects in this context? The physical, real Carpathians and metaphysical or mystical Carpathians and how is it uh, reflected in the fiction and non-fiction literature? Very often, something that we term as non-fiction, like the coverage that should be fact-based, fact-centered, even though it's always subjective, in fact, it always has these uh, fiction intentions. So here, Carpathians are presented not like the locus, but as a topos, as a metaphor and as a myth. And if you develop this topic further, which is uh, probably most interesting for me in terms of literature studies, I would be talking not only about the stereotypization or stereotypization or D and re-stereotypization of the Jews within this unusual space, uncommon space for Jews, where many of them feel organic, uh, but it's also about the senses, the meanings of these poetics and this space. The poetics of Carpathians and the space can open and reveal to us uh, the context uh, of the uh, um, intra-ethnic relations, but not only. Uh, because in this space, these ethnicities were trying to find themselves. They interacted, sometimes they conflicted, other times they overcame these conflicts. But there's also this Carpathian myth or even a meta myth because it's about consolidating various elements and various national myths that would always very often be conflicting and, and uh, contesting. It's also about uh, uh, appropriating certain territories through the presence of the topuses and spaces in the discourse and in the narratives that, that were described. So when we talk about this poetics of space, uh, I would think of a series of intuitions that could develop into the specific questions. And I invite Vladislava to tackle at least some of them. For example, to which extent in this Carpathian a text of this Jewish coverage reportage or this Jewish segment of Carpathian text. Uh, how are Carpathians present there as the space of uh, uh, adventure, as a space of trial, etc. Then again, how does this locus amoenus mythology work here? like a nice, pleasant place, similar to the Adam garden, Carpathians as the God created garden, where you can find the things you've lost. But at the same time, Carpathians as the space of jeopardy, at the space of threat, as the space of danger, where you feel like alien, where you run the risk to lose your dignity, to use your life. Uh, there is another aspect. Many things have been mentioned about the other Jews, about how Jews become different. Others un as impacted by this space, because it's not only that a man creates the space, but the space creates the man. It uh, sounds like uh, old good Montesquieu and the geographic determinism, but maybe it makes some sense. So it's interesting to see 
whether this space was uh, comprehended and uh, uh, understood uh, in this text that you focused on, maybe in other texts, uh, how would Carpathians be presented as a space for a dialogue of meetings or understanding or a space of conflict, uh, uh, disruption and antagonism? The essay by Yuri Andrukhovich that I mentioned in the beginning, uh, I will try to find a short quote from it. There is this the resolution, Carpathian, this is the, the, the huge uh, uh, piece that uh, brings everything together. This is the area of the special energetic uh, peculiarities. They are dividing you in the earthly sense, but they are uniting you in the heavenly sense. Uh, so this this is like a clamp that keeps things together. So from what I understood from your presentation and the text you analyzed, I could realize that Carpathians could both divide and unite. Carpathians are presented as the mystical place or imaginary place, but also geographical place or political or real place. Because when we talk about the political map of world, which is uh, uh, cut into pieces by the borders and these are the borders of the tension in fact so to put it briefly i would like to thank you uh, for your contribution because uh, i found many question marks in my head when listening to your uh, presentation i i didn't have the exclamation marks this is the style of presentation that steps on the unknown territory and i'm not talking about the carpathians now because i believe they also travel through the Carpathians a lot, but this is about the new uh, interesting vector of discovering this topic where uh, Jewish studies uh, and uh, uh, other aspects are combined. Thank you, and I would be happy to listen uh, to any of your feedback. Thank you very much for a very interesting comment, and I need to admit I'm not a literary scholar, then possibly I would not be able i'm a historian you know so i'm not able to get into all of these contexts and i did not read the essay by androkovich but i can clearly understand that i should uh, i'm sorry it's okay to be a historian the same as to be a jew in the carpathians well if you ask about what kind of space i could focus on and whether this space is shaped somehow in the interwar period, I could say that for me, the appropriation of this space in the Carpathians from what I see in the war period was underway. And, and then it was disrupted at some point. There left the people who could uh, contribute to the formation of this place, and then they were exterminated. What was taking place after the war? This is the nostalgic image of the Carpathians uh, picked up by the Yiddish language Romanian writers that I mentioned. And these books were published in the 1960s, in the 1970s, quite late after that time. And they had a lot of nostalgic feelings uh, in them. And they have this uh, really, uh, they take a view from a distance. So obviously all of the authors, they emphasize and highlight that Jews came there quite late. When we talk about Lviv or other places and we take them and see them, I mean, other um, Halichina little towns, we take them and see them as uh, the places with the long lasting and long rooted tradition of Jews. But uh, the Carpathians are presented as the place where Jews came quite late. Uh, and they appropriate this uh, space, especially the Jews. They came to this uh, sub-Carpathia region where this Pesach Baba was described. They emphasize that they are new to this area. And in that sense, these uh, Jewish farmers, uh, they are like the colonists of the Wild West. They came there to these areas because there was the vast land available. There was the place to live in and there was the place to shelter them. And the Jews, uh, came to this to this land 
fleeing the problems and uh, the turbulence in Halechina. We know that in the 19th century, there was not much turbulence actually, as compared to other periods of time or to other territories, but the Carpathians are perceived as the shelter, uh, the place that would host them in a safe haven. So these places where these barons settled down, um, there was the not ordinary and also they were trying to imitate the urban space. They were building their palaces. They were also building the factories, the schools. They bring this urban aspect to these uh, uh, rural areas, in fact. Uh, in a sense, this is also a sort of colonization of this uh, Carpathian land. And we can also read this in this text. Uh, we can read it through these texts. Uh, also, uh, this uh, reporter combines this aspect of Jews uh, from the Austrian Empire and how they could be related. And he's trying to present this odd uh, Holish, Galician Jews uh, in this place uh, and to the Jews uh, that would speak Yiddish in Warsaw. Obviously, he was writing these uh, uh, coverages for the bigger places uh, like Warsaw, New York, the magazines, uh, because in Halachina, uh, this was not the target audience to read these texts uh, because it was not anything uncommon for them to see these Jews in these places. They would be writing these uh, uh, stories for the big magazines in the big cities where this place would be considered exotic. Is this the space for conflict? Well, paradoxically enough, but we do see certain clashes. I just remembered of another text uh, that partially refers to Carpathians, but not really. It, uh, well, it These are the memories of a traveler, a merchant, and he would uh, trade in uh, wine from Porchov, and he went to Tokai. And in the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, he would buy this Tokai wine there and then he came back. So he was traveling, obviously, through the mountain roads. And at some point in his story, he describes how he was attacked by this Opresko uh, people and how the rabbi would shoot back uh, and he had a pistol in each, of, in each hand. So we also see the stories describing such episodes, but this is a different type of story. And they also don't uh, uh, use the word Carpathians. This is sort of a travelogue or a diary, but still it gives us the opportunity to take a look on the other side. So this is uh, something uh, that describes a story of these villains, of these gangs, local gangs, different from how it was presented in the stories of uh, Baal Sham or Alexa Dovbush. But the text that I considered for this research, well, uh, these conflicts um, were smoothed down in these texts. So Carpathians are presented like a part of the new territories that we try to appropriate. I have another specific question. I'm really interested in the topic of Carpathians as the space of change and uh, growth for Jewish young people, about these Jewish youth movements as the certain stage of preparing them to the nation building through non-governmental organizations. When we talk about the Ukrainian political history, we had similar phenomena, like these sports societies, these so-called or siege society or plus the as the ukrainian uh, scouting movement uh, version they also saw their mission in training and preparing the young people as the non-governmental organizations they were preparing the future breakthrough that would eventually end up in the nation building of the ukrainian state so there is certain correlation between this ukrainian and jewish youth movements and here also we have another similarity which is the place the geographical location the carpathians the carpathians was the space of um, uh, shaping your character of uh, changing your mindset uh, 
of uh, growing your personality. Do you know anything of that? When we talk about sports in Lviv, we know that the Ukrainian, Polish and Jewish uh, football teams, they played together. Uh, they had the games, but I'm interested to know when when you speak of these youth movements that you mentioned, do you have any facts like that about them? Thank you for uh, this question. There is the article, uh, the paper, uh, which is published on the website of the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, and they describe this Jewish scout movement, and it's based on the Ukrainian sources. So basically, they. Uh, Mm, shared the stories when the Ukrainian um, plus uh, members uh, went in the camps in the Carpathians, they would describe, we saw that it was a neighboring camp with the Jews. But in these Jewish trips, in this scout movement, um, is different in terms of Carpathians and their perception. Many of these organizations, they um, encouraged people to immigrate, to leave, and also to train them to work physically on the land. And from the point of view of the organizers and from the point of view of society, Jews were traditionally perceived as the people who wouldn't do the physical work. And the point of these organizations was to teach them, to train them, you know, uh, to plow the land, uh, to uh, dig the, the earth and plant the plants, whatever. So this is the way they uh, approach this uh, and uh, wanted to train these young people to do this. Uh, so it was not about the recreational uh, trips. Uh, so these could be the uh, trips with the hard physical labor because they wanted to train them. They uh, had the objective to shape and create a new type of a Jewish person. And the same was about these sports organizations, right? Like the sport would shape you and make you a different mm, person. So this was part of their ideology, which is based on the stereotype of a Jewish person reading many books, uh, doing like, uh, you know, leaning over these books, uh, wearing glasses uh, and etc. And they are trying to overcome this stereotype. And Carpathians assume this additional meaning and connotation different than before. Thank you very much, Vladislav, and thank you to Bohdan. We have other questions that develop on the questions we've heard before, and other participants ask these questions. Irina Sklokina asks the question, how would this proximity of the Jewish and non-Jews living in the same community, how did it impact the Holocaust? And there is the question from Patrice Dombrovsky. The Ukrainians, perhaps also based in the mountain region, who saw the Carpathians, Jews, in a positive light. Over the views, mostly negative. I ask better to understand when the violence of the Holocaust in the region, with many Hutus turning on their Jewish neighbors. This after the population had coexisted for so long. These are related questions, so uh, that's why. Well, I'm not the expert in the Holocaust studies in this region, but I can say uh, some things that might be based on this anecdotic data. I mean, some random data, but they might shed some light to this topic. In the interwar period, uh, Carpathians uh, had the border. The border was crossing their Carpathians. It's an important aspect to know, to, to say, because um, the people who lived in the Carpathians, they were scattered around different valleys and they uh, found themselves uh, on different sides of the border, but uh, they continued to interact and communicate and cross this border all the time and keep contacts. I have a colleague and his family uh, was coming from the Carpathians uh, from a small village near the Volovets uh, place. Uh, there are several villages there 
and he had the story in his family when uh, the sister of his great grandfather uh, she knew that the war uh, was raging and it was the period of soviet occupation and she was on the other side uh, of, of the border on the side of the border uh, with the czech uh, slovak slovakian part and she realized that the war was coming at some point she just uh, grabbed her belongings and uh, went to buy i don't know the matches some food but she crossed the border and she never came back why wouldn't she come back because she crossed this forest border to the soviet part and then she asked for shelter with the red army she was 16 years of age uh, and they brought her to the orphanage and then she uh, would join the army so why would this story be not about the coexistence because in this case it is important to focus on how well this uh, young lady was aware of this forest space or where she should go where she should cross she knows the mountains she understand them and by crossing these forest borders she could save herself but she never took her family along she never told the family she would go and save herself and the family wouldn't know what happened to her and they haven't known this until recently my colleague and i we traveled around this uh, area in transcarpathia trying to find the roots uh, about her fate because uh, there were there was no other contacts with the family. But if we talk about the memories from this area, they don't show any better situation. They show the same stories related with the looting and the uh, after the war, with the killings. Uh, people were afraid of their closest neighbors. In that sense, the situation was not much different but uh, this space probably impacted uh, because people had better understanding how this physical space uh, uh, contributed to their life uh, so in the transcarpathia probably in this area we didn't have uh, this uh, specific uh, developments that are typical of other places because um, people were um, uh, deported from this place rather fast to the concentration camps uh, there was this book and uh, they were researching many researchers researched this uh, in more detail so i'd rather refer you to them also i would like to say about the folklore some uh, part of the folklore um, is positive when you talk about these villains uh, but how far can folklore act as the source when we try to uncover all of these layers and find out who was uh, taking down this folklore uh, some people the same as vincent's the people who were coming from the carpathians they wanted to present the jews in a nice way but if we try to think of the impact factors, I would think of the text by Mikhailo Zubritsky, who was the economist, and he was writing about uh, how society shall develop, Ukrainian society shall develop, which is based on farming. And uh, in the Ukrainian Catholic university there was the phd thesis to this topic so basically he also mentioned the jews in the negative light and also in his context uh, and his texts are negative uh, about them and they are also related to this carpathian background and story i maybe should think more of of the cases i cannot think of the specific examples or illustrations uh, of hand uh, what about uh, you well i would like to take uh, my revenge and to still mention ivan franco because i haven't done so so 
obviously there were the images of Jews uh, that were presented in the positive light by certain Ukrainian authors. But let's be frank and let's call the spade a spade. We're talking about the differences, ethnic differences that are clearly manifested in the folklore, but they are based on the stereotypes. And these stereotypes are rather malicious. Uh, and this is related to the mutual hetero stereotypization of different nations uh, and different ethnicities. I uh, don't think that we're going to have any research when these Jewish folklore texts about Ukrainians uh, would be researched or the Ukrainian folklore texts about Jews when they would be researched. They're not going to have many positive things. They're going to be uh, rather stereotypical and negative about each other. But uh, there is another level, not of mass conscience, but about reflection and uh, philosophical reflection. When we talk about the early 20th century and then about the interwar period. In the Ukrainian context, we see these approaches to interpreting the image of Jews in the Ukrainian civilizational space, in the central European cultural space, rather. And also there are these artistic images about that. And here I would mention Ivan Franco. He was very often uh, described as the anti-Semitic author and some five to seven years ago, there was this scandalous situation in Vienna. Uh, there were some of his texts distorted. Some of the quotes were uh, uh, taken out of them and they were used as the evidence for the anti-Semitism. However, Ivan Franco was distinct in the Ukrainian cultural context because he could see the parallels between the Jewish political movements at that time and the Ukrainian national movements. It's not only about this poem Moses, but also these uh, cross-cutting uh, paths uh, uh, because it's fiction and non-fiction. It's the mix of the uh, novel and uh, the uh, travelogue artistic uh, coverage. There is this interesting idea of Bachmann, a strange uh, uh, Jewish person, and uh, he was trying to uh, convince his uh, nephews out of the stereotypical attitude to Ukrainians. Uh, and this is the illustration of a dialogue between the intellectuals who used to live in Halachina, where you have this Vahman, the Jew, and there was Yevhenia Rafalovich, the main character. Uh, who had the specific attitude. So we have cases of positive coverage of Jews in the literature. Also, there is this dialogue on the level of political concepts and philosophical works. Ivan Franco was one of the first reviewers of the Herzen's Jewish state. He wrote the review to this work. It was a very positive and interesting review. So this topic uh, would be interesting to consider in all of its uh, poly uh, format uh, manifestations. Thank you, Bogdan. We have more questions. Uh, I will read them out in the Ukrainian. Victoria Goldberg asks the question to Vladislava, I think. Does this image of Jewish Carpathians have the Hungarian speaking Carpathian Jews? Have you come across any stories with the Jews speaking Hungarian? And there is another question. Sava Weisler asked the question, in what sources uh, uh, do the Ukrainian legends, non-Jewish legends uh, come up about the Baal Shem Tov? And do you have any? Thank you for these questions about the Hungarian Jews. Since I don't speak Hungarian, most of the information that I used come from the book by Yeshiahu Yelinek that is entitled Jews in Transcarpathia. It's in English and it's available in Russian and in Hebrew. And in this book, Yelinek writes 
about how the Jews uh, lived there. And he describes a very interesting process throughout the 19th century of the cultural adaptation. The Jews that immigrated to Transcarpathia, they were mostly Hasidic and they supported the Polish Tzaddiks. Uh, they uh, came to this area from Transcarpathia and they settled down there. Uh, whatever you call this place, right? And they kept supporting this uh, tzaddiks. But at the same time, this area was in the under the cultural influence of Bratislava. In Bratislava, they had their own religious leaders, and they were either Orthodox uh, Jews. Uh, but not Hasidic. So the history of the 19th century, and they were Hungarian speaking actually, the history of Jews of the 19th century is the history of acculturation and adaptation of Jews to uh, becoming, um, well, different because before they could speak uh, two languages, uh, um, Yiddish and the language Ukrainian or whenever they lived, but in the 19th century, they are leaving their Hasidic rabbis and uh, they come uh, into dependence of the rabbi from the localities of Bratislava. And this is uh, already, they find themselves in the cultural field of Bratislava. This is what I can say about this question. About the question, um, in what sources do the Ukrainian non Jewish legends about the Balshem Tov appear? There is this source Balshem Tov with Christians, among Christians. It was published in the magazine, the monthly, the Jewish monthly in 1934. And it tells how Christians treat Balshem. Since uh, the author was doing this research himself, but also he refers to the research by his colleagues, and there are references to this research there. I just need to make sure I can actually um, send it to you. And, and this is on the chat, I just copied it. This is the source in Polish. Thank you, Vladislava. So you have the link on the chat to this reference that you mentioned. And we have another comment from uh, Dr. Roman Golik, also a literary scholar and the representative of the cultural history. And he says that, yes, indeed, there is no unanimous interpretation of Jews in the text. Uh, we have very different uh, perceptions. We have the images of the wealthy Jews, obviously, uh, who were the merchants, uh, who were in commerce, and they were sort of um, carriers of the urban culture, often associated with the modernizing changes, but they also were associated with the some sort of danger. But on the other hand, in the Ukrainian literature of Carpathians and Subcarpathians, there are stories of the poor Jews, and they lived among the peasants as the peasants, and they were fully dependent on the goodwill of the others. And there are also images of the religious Hasidic Jews, and they were aloof of the economy or politics. And there are other images. Um, the concepts of Jews in the non-Jewish environment were very different and uh, maybe even mixed or hybrid. Maybe you could comment on that. Thank you to Roman. And I find it difficult to generalize at this point. I'm not a literary scholar. We know about Ivan Franco that Mr. Techolos mentioned. It was uh, the psychologism and you have uh, this article about Bo Constrictor where we shift from a negative image of a Jew who is trying to uh, really uh, cheat on the poor workers and we have the shift to the Jew with a complicated uh, life. Uh, so Ivan Franco, this is like a high quality good literature that has these images, but at the same time there is this image 
um, which is based on the uh, Baal Shem uh, image. And there is this place near the Vizhnitsa place, the place where the Baal Shem Tov uh, allegedly uh, swam. So when you go there, even today, the local people will be telling you these stories and legends, and they are not negative. So, I mean, there is this general fascination about this Hasidic uh, uh, piece uh, about Baal Shem. But there are also many texts uh, about, you know, the um, pub owners, and there are these uh, uh, stories of the 19th century, and they're fascinated about the uh, these Opreshko people, that they were beaten by the Jews, uh, or vice versa. And I think that literary scholars could tell more about that, about this topic. From those who still remain with us in this during this beautiful and interesting discussion. Uh, so please raise your hand in the lower uh, bar of Zoom. Uh, you can find uh, reactions and then you can raise your hand and you can uh, ask loudly your questions if you have. If not, uh, yeah, I will switch to Ukrainian again. Uh, if not, well, I would like to ask the question, a brief question in conclusion. My personal experience uh, interacting with people from Subcarpathia and Transcarpathia, especially in localities where you have these mass uh, killing sites uh, where they used to live before but they don't live any longer so my experience shows that people are very cautious they don't feel like talking about this maybe this is typical of other places where jews were killed but in carpathians it sounds and looks like a modus of secrecy and unwillingness to talk about this this is also the story about the jewish carpathians have you noticed anything like do you have this feeling or impression about that or is it my personal impression or emotion i think it depends who you talk uh, to i have an impression that when you talk about people who come from the carpathians and who do some research they have a strong image of the ukrainian carpathians which does not admit anyone else there and this makes the communication with them very complicated because it, it, it does impact their attitude and their position in research. Because in Transcarpathia, there, there, is, there are many peculiarities like that. But when we talk about Subcarpathia, this is a more complicated region. Uh, the story that I shared, I have this experience about the sister of the great grandfather who uh, came from this mountainous place. So in, in, uh, in this process of searching for her, my friend uh, was uh, taking the interpreter and they were going around all of the villages around this place. And they managed to find some senior people who were sharing quite open and frank stories about the marauding stuff, about the looting, about killing the neighbors. They did share these stories, but it took a lot of time to win their trust. And he was asking thoroughly all of the careful questions first winning their trust but senior people they are ready to share as to younger people i think the situation is similar um, as in other uh, little towns and the situation is aggravated by the fact that the mobility in these regions is not that high they usually live in the same place for a long time and um, talking well voicing things and talking things out loud might sound complicated and it's difficult for them not because of the fear but because they are part of this community and it, it it's not nice talking about that 
Thank you, Vladislava. In conclusion, since we don't have other questions, I would like to insert a couple of words uh, at my reflection. I'm privileged to be a moderator, so I will take the privilege. I would very often ask this question that Bogdan mentioned, where would Carpathians start and where would they end? Very often I could hear the answer. The Carpathians start behind the town, Starid, Samber, Samber, Kolomeya, Snyaten. I mean, these are the places where the Jews used to live in big numbers. They were the first contact points for the people from the mountains when they came down to the valleys. In the historiography, this story is not always present. It could be disappearing because there are dominant images of the Polish Tatras, of the Ukrainian Carpathians. And this Jewish thread, uh, little thread of this history could be lost. So we are happy and grateful to have Vladislava today help us uh, rediscover this little thread and talk about this non-visible, non-apparent uh, uh, residents of uh, the Carpathians. I was thinking about the attribute to use, the adjective to use, no ethnic adjective, just the human Carpathians. They belong to the mankind, okay? Thank you very much to everyone who was listening to me. Thank you to the commenters. I really took down many new ideas and I really feel like I want to learn more. And I believe the same as Mr. Tehulo says, this implies that this presentation was fruitful. These are the fruits that I have. Thank you also uh, for the questions to Patrice, to uh, Mr. Holik, to Ms. Weisler, to other people. I appreciate. I would also like to express my gratitude to Martin Rode, to Botan Techolos for your effort for reading the uh, essay, the abstract before, and for your comments. Thank you, everyone who joined this lecture. Uh, in the chat, you have the link to our next uh, lecture about the Kolomea based photographer Julius Dutkevich or Julian Dutkevich. Ksenia Kibuzinski, Dr. Ksenia Kibuzinski from the University of Toronto will tell us about another interesting story related to the Carpathians. Welcome, it's going to be interesting and uh, see you later. Thank you, Vladislava.